Oh, the Jesus way. Oh, the Jesus way. Is the way of peace. Is the way of peace. Oh, the Jesus way. Oh, the Jesus way. Is the way of peace. Is the way of peace. Oh, the Jesus way. Is the way of peace. When He is King, all wars will cease. May His peace begin with me. Gonna beat my sword. Gonna beat my sword. Into a plow. Into a plow. Gonna beat my sword. Gonna beat my into a plow, into a plow. Gonna, gonna beat my sword into a plow. Christ is king in my life now. May his peace begin with me. From Cincinnati, Ohio, on the banks of the Ohio River, Brethren Voices meets with brethren from our nation's capital. You'll meet Jerry O'Donnell, who works on Capitol Hill as the communications director and senior advisor to Congresswoman Grace Napolitano of California's 32nd Congressional District. This is Brent Carlson. Welcome to Brethren Voices. You'll also meet Nathan Hostler of the Church of the Brethren Office of Peacebuilding and Policy. Nathan is one of the free pastors of the Washington City Church of the Brethren, and he is a person who is very much focused on the legislation that is making its way through Congress. We had a wonderful opportunity to meet with both of these young brethren at the Church of the Brethren Annual Conference in Cincinnati. Jerry O'Donnell works on Capitol Hill as a communications director and senior advisor to Congresswoman Grace Napolitano of California's 32nd Congressional District located in Southern California. Currently, Grace Napolitano is serving her 10th term in the House of Representatives. And Jerry O'Donnell has been serving in her office for approximately nine years. He grew up in the Church of the Brethren and attended Juniata College. He served a year in Brethren Volunteer Service before going to the Dominican Republic to coordinate work camps for Brethren groups. Jerry then served as an intern for Grace Napolitano before being hired on and is now her press secretary and senior advisor. We met with Jerry at the Church of the Brethren Annual Conference held in Cincinnati. I think the last time we spoke, I was uh, press secretary for the yeah. Congresswoman, handling uh, a number of legislative issues. Uh, and I am still the, the press person. I've been given a little bump in title uh, because of my, my years and development in the position. And so now I'm her communications director. I was going to say director of communications. Yeah. That seems to be a... An yeah. A title that's going around this week. Yeah, communications director, uh, and I'm also a senior advisor to the congresswoman uh, on those same issues, issues of immigration, education, civil rights, homeland security, um, religious issues, and then uh, any number of uh, breaking news, um, you know, items that require a fast response. I tend to speak to the congresswoman, gauge her uh, opinion and, and uh, how we should react and then, uh, you know, I follow through on that, so. Yeah. At least three of those are hot issues uh, this, 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 at this time, huh? Yes, definitely. So how do, uh, so how is she, how is she doing, first of all? She's, she's doing well, thank you. Uh, she's uh, she up in for her, re election again? She is, yeah, every two years, the House of Representatives, uh, every, every seat is up for re-election or, or is, is part of the election. And so um, in the June primary, she won unopposed. Uh, she had nobody challenging her. And so um, she, she should be fine in November with no one else on the ballot. Uh, so she plans to uh, you know, serve another term and then uh, we'll see beyond that. But um, you know, she's showing no signs of slowing down. In fact, we're, we're uh, forging ahead. So. so tell us her what district and her name and uh, and yeah, her name is Grace Napolitano, um, and she represents the 32nd district of California. Which is where? It's in East Los Angeles County, okay. um, and it's in the the area is known as the San Gabriel Valley. So what? Uh, actually, isn't Congress on recess right now? Yes, they're in recess this week, which has enabled me to be here at annual conference uh, wearing another hat, uh, serving as a delegate for my congregation in D.C., the Washington City Church of the Brethren. I think we just talked to one of your pastors earlier. Because mm -hmm. he has a role um, at, for the 
connection with policy and, and peace building. Yeah, yeah peace. that's right. So, so, what's going to be happening with immigration and and all of this? To you, what do you think is going to happen? Um, is there a way to tell what's going to happen? So, I, I don't think there's a way to tell what's happening, but I can point us to. Uh, the recent rejections um, nationwide, uh, the vast majority of Americans uh, standing up against uh, the inhumanity that's uh, been going on at the border. And separating the children and their parents. Right. Um, which, w going back a little before the separation of, of, of families, the forced separation of families, um, was the, the zero tolerance, uh, what they called, the zero tolerance policy of prosecuting any individual entering uh, our southern border, our southwest border, um, whether at a port of entry or a non-port of entry. So the zero tolerance policy uh, created this, this crisis, um, this uh, atrocity of, of taking children away from their parents as, as many um, refugees, asylum seekers, uh, people entering from, from uh, the south. Uh, they were they were forcibly removed um, from their children and detained, and it was that policy, that cruel policy, that put us in that situation. Well, a federal judge, yes. as I understand it, has has ordered the government to reunite those families, and the deadline is next Tuesday. Right. And we're not sure if that's going to come and go without anything really being done or not. Right. Uh, do you know what the next step is? Well, the judge could hold some people in contempt, I assume. Well, the judge could, and the administration could appeal and say that they need more time, and, and you know, they do need more time. We know that because this whole um, inhumane, uh, I would say, uh, approach to um, refugees fleeing and, and those uh, coming into our country. Uh, some seeking, you know, safety. Some seeking um, a, just a better life, a better situation. Um, they were automatically treated like criminals. But some are, are legitimately uh, fleeing from fleeing from persecution. And right from the Northern Triangle, the, the countries in Central America, Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala, um, where the, there are more homicides daily than anywhere else in the Western Hemisphere, um, where uh, gangs give uh, families an ultimatum of whether uh, they, they are going to stay in their homes and risk being uh, murdered, uh, have their children's being, uh, children being abducted, uh, uh, wives and mothers being raped. Uh, they, they face that choice whether to, to stay there and run that risk or try to leave and, and find some safety and security and, and that's, you know, the United States has always up until you know recent times has welcomed uh, the oppressed and been a refuge and and you know that's biblical as well and I think the Church of the Brethren is right to be um, very uh, very staunchly opposed to what uh, the Trump administration has done recently uh, but going back to your question what what happens next um, we don't really know because a, a, a detailed process wasn't put in place when children were separated from their parents. Some of those children were sent to shelters uh, in other parts of the country and um, some of those children remained in the, the Rio Grande Valley or in Arizona or in Southern California um, uh, where these, uh, the, 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 mo the majority of people were entering the country and then being separated. And so you know, it would be nice to say everyone's going to be reunited by then, but uh, the reality is it's going to take a lot longer. Yeah. So, yeah. And there's no, uh, there's no clear path to reunion either. No, there isn't. Uh, it's very difficult because people didn't leave any identification. And uh, you're looking for, uh, you know, people that are, that are now scattered and, and you're, you're trying to reunite children in the United States um, whose parents or, or parent may, may have already been deported. Um, they might have already come before an immigration judge and, uh, and they were sentenced to removal and then deported from the U.S. And so that's going to be an extra challenge because people aren't here uh, because of the irresponsible decision to, to break families apart. Let me, let me just ask in, in a more general way, uh, do you still think people can make a difference? And 
And if they can, what can they do? What can people who might be listening to this program do to uh, speak out? Absolutely. If I didn't think people could make a difference, and I wouldn't be in my current position. I, my responsibility is to the public, is to the people in, in my boss's district in Southern California, in 32nd District. And our job is to be attentive to their needs. And when people speak and, and raise their voices and come to events and speak with conviction, we listen. We may not immediately act and we may not uh, immediately propose legislation, but our job in the, in the business of public service is to be responsive to that. And as I always say, there are people that are paid in Washington, that live in Washington, that, that collect good paychecks, and their sole job is to make their voice known to legislators. And if we, as, as Church of the Brethren, as people of faith, people with conviction, uh, speaking uh, truth to power, if we do not share our voice and let our, our nation's leaders know, the people who are in charge of policy making, then the lobbyists in Washington who represent corporations, who represent you know, very, very special interests outside of uh, our, our, our denomination, uh, if, we, if we let them be the sole voice, then ours is drowned out or unheard of. And so what you've seen, this is the, this is the um, moment of, of, of light that we've seen uh, recently. You see people showing up and getting out and jamming phone lines uh, of their representatives and their senators. You see them um, not let this issue become part of a 24-hour news cycle, which, it, which it is... Here today, gone tomorrow. It is, it, yes, exactly. And so... Uh, you see people um, really taking action, really um, acting on their faith, and, and they can make a difference. Even if they are just you know, writing a letter, they are showing up to an event, um, but where you, know, you have maybe a few, uh, you, could, you could have dozens join, and then that voice is amplified. So it takes one person to start, maybe one church, but then you suddenly that grows to a district, perhaps a denomination, and then that, that continues. And so a lot of the uh, discussions and, and some of the witness that's been happening here in Cincinnati um, lends itself to the larger um, uh, reaction uh, to this in, inhumane situation that, that uh, has occurred regrettably um, on our southern border. So um, actually one person I heard said, you know, if you can if you can send an email, fine. If you can make a call, fine. If you can write a letter, even better. If you can visit, even better. So we shouldn't give up hope, and we should, we should do what we feel we can do to uh, let our, our Congress and re representatives know w what's important to us? Yes, uh, absolutely. And in addition to that, um, it, it, it shouldn't just be to our representatives in Washington. While um, it's important to contact uh, the, the senators and representatives. Uh, it should be at the local level as well, to city councils, to mayors, to um, even, even school boards that, that face a lot of these same decisions about uh, students in their communities and protecting families. Um, it, it, it's, it's not solely incumbent on the, the, the top level. It's what happens in our communities as well. And in some ways there's a stalemate and one of the things now is the, the nomination of a, a new Supreme Court justice. Yes, uh, that has uh, the nation's spotlight right now as um, President Trump is now um, going to be nominating his second Supreme Court justice uh, within his first two years of his presidency. And uh, this is something that uh, everyone should be looking at very closely as we know, Supreme Court justices serve a, a life sentence on the bench. And um, so this is a person who... For a life term. A life term, yeah. Uh, they, 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 serve, they serve for life. Um, and uh, they, they could have great impact. Uh, Justice Anthony Kennedy 
uh, was kind of a swing justice as he was known for on some issues. Um, he, he uh, you know, uh, he voiced his his uh, his authority one way and uh, in other ways um, differently. But uh, that President Trump has indicated that he is going to nominate a certain kind of justice. Well, we need to know exactly who that person might be and if they uh, should be trusted with such an important seat in our, in our government. It's always an honor to meet with Jerry O'Donnell to hear his thoughts about what is happening in Washington, D.C. The Congresswoman, Grace Napolitano, is seeking her 11th term in the House of Representatives, running unopposed in the November election. We turn to page two. When Jesus said, give unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and to God that which is God's, he left it wide open for our interpretation. In 1989, the Church of the Brethren attempted to provide some thought and action to that statement of Jesus. The annual conference passed a statement. Christians and the church are called at times to speak a prophetic word to the state. When the state is doing things that negate and deny God's will as revealed in Jesus Christ and the Bible. Christians must speak out, doing so in love and respect for those engaged in wrongdoing and for those who are being wronged, as stated in Ephesians 4.15. When the state is doing things which move in the general direction of God's will and way, such as addressing human well-being, justice, and peace, Christians can give support and commendation. Most decisively, they are to step back from alignment with and participation in the violence of the state, violence that could now destroy God's earthly creation. While at conference, we were also able to meet with Nathan Hostler of the Church of the Brethren Office of Peacebuilding and Policy, located in the nation's capital. We asked Nathan about his background and what led him into the ministry and the Ministry of the Office of Peacebuilding and Policy. The Washington office is now called the Office of Peacebuilding and Policy. Um, I started first working with the Church of the Brethren in Nigeria. In 2009, went to work with EYN, Church of the Brethren in Nigeria, um, to help expand their peacebuilding work. My spouse and I, Jen, Jennifer Hustler, and I went and both worked in this. And then after that, in 2012, moved to D.C. to, to pick up this work. Um, the Washington City Church, um, we in 2013 proposed a, they hadn't had a pastor for several years, and we proposed going to the old free ministry model. And so Jen is one of the pastors, I am, and there's one other person, and some other people that rotate through preaching. And so we all have other full-time work. So my full-time work is the denomination, and my side project is the Washington City Church. Have you been brethren all your life? Yeah, I grew up at Chickie's Church of the Brethren in, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Tell us what's going on. Well, there's always a lot going on any year and any time. Um, in the last number of years, we've tried to align the, the Washington office work more closely with um, other projects of the denomination or other denominational staff work. And so uh, a few years ago, after the abductions of the schoolgirls from Chibok, we started a Nigeria working group. And this has now bloomed and blossomed into a very robust working group of some of the largest humanitarian organizations and peace building and human rights organizations. And we. You know, recently, about three weeks ago, I was asked to brief the U.S. Ambassador on International Religious Freedom He's on for his first trip going to Nigeria. And so we've, that's gotten quite established and is quite big and, of course, ties to our Church of the Brethren work in Nigeria and my former work there. Um, Tori um, Bateman, my Brethren Volunteer Service worker, recently went to Burundi um, on a work camp and will start um, building, building some advocacy work around the Great Lakes region. So for us, the DRC, Rwanda, and Burundi, where there are Church of the Brethren congregations or projects. And so since we have projects there and now relationships, we're starting to do advocacy. There's also some concern about the political stability and a range of other things. And so we're beginning to learn about this and then see who else is working on this in DC, whether um, non-governmental organizations also making connections with the US government who focus on this. The Church of the Brethren is a small denomination and we asked Nathan about how the work is being carried out. By small groups? 
we're almost always working some sort of group. And so sometimes there's working groups. So the Nigeria working group is a working group and that's, there's no sign on principles. I mean, if you really disagree with us, you wouldn't want to work with us, but we, we all generally are working the same way, but we don't have a list of policies that we've all endorsed and we don't have our names on all the same thing. So that's, we meet in that case once a month, we'll assess the situation, what's happening. We'll also work in between, we'll say. But now when you say we, is it people from the government or uh, people with other churches? This would primarily be other churches, so Mennonite Central Committee, for example, participates in this, but also staff from Amnesty International, which is a human rights organization, staff from Search for Common Ground, which is a peace-building organization. We'll gather somewhere in D.C., usually once a month, and have a, an hour-long meeting discussing where we, you know, if we need to write a letter on something and raise concerns. Um, recently, we were working to have, for example, the, we heard that the ambassador for international religious freedom was going to Nigeria f for the first time, and so we said, well, it'd be good for us to meet with him and brief him because it was his first time, and so we started communicating with the staff, and he put us in connection. I was going to meet with one of his staff to make the case that we should meet with the ambassador himself, but then that very morning, my son was born, <laughs> and so I had to cancel, I had Tori cancel for me since I was in the hospital. But um, Tori wasn't able to go in your place. No, but we ended up having the meeting, and so this, you know, we would, for those, we wanted to meet with the ambassador to help shape his opinion yeah. and ask the questions he would ask of the Nigerian government. Other cases, like for, on the Middle East, for example, Church of the Brethren is a founding member of Churches for Middle East Peace, which is a coalition of 28 denominations. In this case, formal it's a formal organization, and so we have a set of 13 policy principles that we revisit, and these are state where we're at on, particularly the issue of Israel and Palestine, but also broadly on the Middle East. And each of those organizations then re sent a representative to the board, which is where we do the work. So I'm actually chairing their board presently and so in that case I'm doing more governance sort of work and organizational work so that they can do the direct work with US government by involved in some ways so I've met with them I've gone to meet with the Israeli embassy for example last year I was in Israel and Palestine with the board yeah, meeting physically, went physically there. there and we were meeting with a variety of government and interfaith and nonprofit peace building sort of people um, some of that learning from them some of them expressing our joint concern some you know building relationships so that in the future you have more ability to help shape opinion or have access into shaping that opinion. We wondered whether the church was responding to the concerns that are being raised today by the annual conference. We try to have our work come out of the concern of the church and so all of our work comes out of annual conference statements and so we can't do anything that doesn't have solid backing with annual conference statements. I would say the most significant um, connection of interest where it's aligned with other areas of work. So Nigeria, you know, is a huge effort for the den whole denomination on a wide range of things and this then feeds into, we have a long connection, a history, relationships, and so that that's had a lot of traction. Um, drone warfare to some degree as well, and we were the first, one of the first denominations to have an official statement on drone warfare. It, that came out of my office originally, went to Mission Ministry Board, and then came to annual conference. So that again, we have a specific, specific gift to the broader ecumenical community uh, that we have, but um, you know, tying that, which is a little more abstract and far away from most people, becomes a little more difficult. Um, but I'd say generally we've had um, very strong interest here at annual conference. We had, uh, because of the ongoing um, discussion and concern around immigration. Um, we decided to, along with intercultural ministries and a few other staff, to organize a vigil on the first night of annual conference. And we had great turnout for that and we had many people expressing concern about what was happening and you know, many people being concerned that we weren't doing enough, um, which is always, um, there are many things it's to work always on. True, it's it? always true. It always feels true and I'm always very aware that it's true. And we, we attempt to, to do enough, recognizing that it's never quite enough. <laughs> These two men are greatly involved in what is happening in the nation's capital. And we ask, what gives you hope that we can actually make a difference? Yeah, hope is a tricky thing. Uh, I, our work in the Nigeria Working Group, for example, is, I would say, a significant point of hope because we've focused, we've had a, a clear purpose and a clear direction and articulated that and have put effort into it and it's, it's grown and we're getting uh, recognized in multiple layers. So that, that gives hope and that of course is not just our work but that then builds out of the historic and the broad-based concern from the, the whole denomination. Um, 
I am also hopeful there's a number of young adults who have either interned with me or have been in a variety of ways connections, seeing how they've continued and hearing their stories of how you know, these sorts of engagements have, have shaped their, their calling to peacemaking and um, the work. I would also say generally uh, engaging with congregations who are genuinely engaged in their community and service and peacemaking uh, gives me hope. People will at various points ask why we're in DC and why we're doing this thing as if it's something radically different from everything else we do. And I would simply say it's, a, it's an extension of service and we all believe we should help others. It's, it's maybe a little more complex than handing food to someone, but it's complex in different ways. Both are complex. Um, it's, so it's simply an extension of our service and peacemaking. So when I see, um, in the case of gardens, when I see, uh, for example, in Lybrook, New Mexico, um, there's the Lybrook um, Community Ministries, uh, the mission there, um, Jim and Kim Therry, and they've, they've been involved very locally in their community. We've engaged with them on gardening. They've come and spoke, spoken at the Christian Citizenship Seminars, which is a, a way to engage high schoolers. After that, they came and spoke to Environmental Protection Agency folks in D.C. And so this is a really fascinating because they have a robust local engagement that is relational and hands-on but then starts asking bigger questions of why is this community perpetually hungry? Why is it perpetually marginalized? Why, why are the coal, why are the, the gas and oil regulations enforced outside the reservation but not in the reservation? And so then this, they start engaging in advocacy um, as an extension of the service and peacemaking. And so they're seeing that and seeing how it connects into DC, which often feels very slow and like we get setbacks um, also gives me a lot of hope. Well now it's up to each one of us and these days of uncertainty from one day to the next we need to keep involved with our elected officials. During the times of Jesus a million people died at the hands of the Roman government and today people are seeking a better life and being placed in prison and their children are being taken away. We need to let our representatives know when we agree with their policies and when we disagree. This is Brent Carlson for Brethren Voices, wishing you peace.